I'm Charlie Eaton. I'm a hand surgeon and I direct the U.S.-based nonprofit Dupuytren Research Group. I'm going to review obstacles to Dupuytren Research and explain why and how the Dupuytren Research Group is conducting crowdsourced biomarker research. I have no conflicts of interest. Why are you watching this presentation? Well, Dupuytren is fascinating and a little horrifying. Dupuytren is technically challenging. It's a flagship model to study genetic fibrosis. You or someone you know might have Dupuytren. I'm interested for all these reasons, but mainly interested in the elephants in the room. The first elephant is that Dupuytren needs better long-term outcomes. Many with Dupuytren never need treatment. Most do well with treatment, but some don't. They can lose function despite treatment and sometimes because of treatment. On the left, after many Dupuytren procedures, this man's fingers feel strange, like they're not his. Stiff, numb, tender. He's had three minimally invasive procedures since this picture, and his hands are even worse today. On the right, this anesthesiologist had an unplanned amputation because his finger couldn't be revascularized at the end of a redo fasciectomy. You can see from the posture of his hand just how satisfied he is. Failed Dupuytren treatment is the most common reason for elective finger amputation. 8% amputation rate for revision fasciectomy after dermofasciectomy. That's a tough statistic for a benign, slowly progressive, usually painless condition. But maybe these folks just didn't have the right operation. This physician was diagnosed with Dupuytren in 2006. By 2015, she'd been treated with fasciectomy and radiotherapy and still had nodular disease with progressive contractures. She's been on TNF blockers the entire time for another diagnosis. In 2017, she had a dermofasciectomy and resurfacing with a radial forearm fascia flap and a skin graft and an early outcome so beautiful I was jealous of the surgeon. But her Dupuytren remained active. Three years later, she has a functional amputation and both she and her surgeon have given up. She has failed the best treatment that we currently have to offer. And she's not alone. That's frustrating. Dupuytren is frustrating in general. Persistent. Unpredictable. But in truth, it's not that Dupuytren is persistent. It's that we don't have an effective disease-modifying treatment. And it's not that Dupuytren is unpredictable. It's that we don't have useful disease measurements. What do we need to do to change this? Let's start by reviewing where we are. We use an 1800s treatment model. Wait for a finger to bend, treat the bend, and repeat as needed. For some people, the disease eventually settles down. For others, the endpoint of treatment is not that the disease stops, it's when the patient or the surgeon says stop, no more. What determines treatment outcomes? For immediate outcomes, it's the pretreatment angular contracture. We can optimize this by intervening when the angle is between 20 and 40 degrees for the best results. The biggest influence on outcome in the first few years after a procedure is the type of procedure, and we can optimize this with the procedure that we choose, open versus minimally invasive. Long-term outcomes depend on the person's biology, and we don't have a way to optimize this or even measure this. We use diathesis factors as a proxy measurement. Diathesis is like a recipe for baking a cake. You blend in age of onset, a little family history, disease locations outside the palms, other ingredients. It's helpful, but it's not quite what we need. Diathesis is not a measurement. It's an educated guess. We need better measurements. And this is the second elephant in the room, the questionable validity of our measurements, angles, demographics, progression, and biology. Let's talk about Dupuytren angle measurements. Angle measurements are great for measuring joint contractures. They're not as reliable for measuring superficial soft tissue contractures like in burn scars and Dupuytren cords. The angular change from a cord contracture depends on how close the cord is to the joint's axis of rotation. On average, lateral cords are closer to the joint axis than central cords, more so at the PIP joint. The closer a cord is to the joint axis, the greater its effect on angular change. The two triangles show the same length of cord shortening. The red cord, closer to the joint axis, gives a greater angular change than the blue cord. PIP cords are closer to the joint axis than MCP cords. Lateral cords are closer to the joint axis than central cords. 
At the PIP level, the distance between a lateral cord and the joint axis might be 6 millimeters. The vertical red line shows at this distance, shortening a cord by 3 millimeters produces more than 25 degrees of angular change. Compare this to a central PIP cord 10 millimeters palmar to the joint axis. The vertical blue line shows at this distance, the same shortening produces less than 15 degrees of change. The smaller the joint, the smaller this distance, and the greater the angular effect. This explains the curse of pinky finger PIP joints, where three factors converge. One, PIP joints are smaller than MCP joints. Two, pinky finger joints are smaller in general than those of the other fingers. Three, lateral PIP cords are more common in the pinky finger. It's not a curse, it's just geometry. And we can't measure this geometry in the office, but we can model it and measure the model. These charts show model measurements of cord length changes versus angular joint changes at five degree increments. Top right, PIP joint, lateral cord shortening in this model produced 40% more angular change than the same shortening of a central cord. Bottom right, MCP, cords are closer together, less effect. This predicts angular contractures from lateral cords will progress faster than from central cords, particularly at the PIP joint. And there's the issue of cords spanning the ulnar carpal metacarpal joints, which we can't easily measure. Images with yellow show typical measurements with the CMC joint unconstrained. People unconsciously flex their CMC joints to increase extension of the more distal joints. In the images with green, I'm holding the CMC joints in extension to show the actual contracture. Enormous difference. Take home point, our individual angle measurements don't directly represent Dupuytren anatomy or disease progression. Let's move on to demographics, age of onset. Two problems. First, we should say age of diagnosis, not age of onset. Dupuytren onset is invisible. We know there are changes in tissue mechanics, histology, and gene expression long before any visible changes. Second, age of diagnosis is biased by family history. Years ago, I wanted to see if the rate of angular contracture degrees per year might reflect biologic severity. And I reviewed a couple thousand Dupuytren patients from my practice who had no prior treatment. If you add up the total angular contracture, all joints of all fingers, and divide by the self-reported duration of disease, you might conclude that people with no Dupuytren in their family contract faster than those with a family history of disease, the opposite of what you'd expect. The simplest explanation is family history bias on the age of diagnosis. People with Dupuytren in the family are more likely to notice and to diagnose Dupuytren at an earlier stage of disease. And here's the proof. If you normalize for the degree of contracture at the time of first treatment, people with a family history of Dupuytren report a longer duration of disease than those without. That's a problem without an easy solution. So what about using patient age instead of self-reported duration of diagnosis? Dupuytren's genetic. People have the same genes their entire life. If you calculate lifetime rate of contraction by dividing the total angular contracture by age, you find family history has little effect on the rate of contraction. Take home point, age of onset might not be a good measurement of biologic severity or a predictor of disease progression before treatment. The next problem is the measurement of basic clinical biology. The left hand has soft, untethered skin over a well-defined cord. On the right, the skin is hard, immobile, and the fat has been replaced by fibrous tissue. What are the biologic differences, not just between these two hands, but between these two people? Here on the left, there's soft skin and the person swears they never had a nodule. On the right, nodules all over the palm for years, no contracture. And the skin is just not normal. The dermal ridges are inflated, almost like the peau d'orange appearance of dermal edema in breast cancer. What are the biologic differences between these two people? Here on the left, thin thread-like cords. On the right, the cord is broad and ill-defined with obvious skin involvement. What are the underlying biologic differences between these two people? Are these even the same disease? We lack a simple way to measure these obvious biologic differences. We have biologic measurements, but they're not quite what we need. We only have biopsies from fasciectomy tissue because isolated biopsy can be like gasoline on a fire for Dupuytren progression. And cell culture changes the cells. 
Dupuytren affected tissues are exquisitely sensitive to their mechanical environment and they change gene expression almost immediately after harvest. Here's the point. Our current measurements are not adequate to develop and test preventive treatments. What do we need to do to get to a future where Dupuytren is managed medically and only occasionally referred to a surgeon? The first step is to update our definition of Dupuytren. Let's all agree Dupuytren is not a surgical disease. It's a chronic medical disease because it's genetic, systemic, and slowly progressive. It's a process, not an event, like rheumatoid or gout or cardiovascular disease. Now, sometimes you have to do surgery for complications of a chronic medical disease. And when you do, that's the definition of failed disease management. Dupuytren is where it is today because of differences between surgical and chronic disease research models. Surgery is event-based intervention, correcting problems after they happen, damage control. The focus is anatomy and procedures. Chronic disease research is process-based, preventing problems before they happen. Anatomy and clinical data alone aren't useful in developing preventive treatments. So here's an example of the problem. When someone develops their first Dupuytren nodule, what happens? 10% chance it'll go away without any treatment. 20% chance the person will need a corrective procedure within the next 10 years. With these type of statistics, if our only outcome measurement is finger angles, we'd need a huge years long study to judge the effectiveness of any single preventive treatment. This is the challenge of all chronic disease research. And the workaround is to use biomarker measurements instead of clinical measurements. We need better ways to measure the biology. We know a lot about local Dupuytren biology. Local disease in the hand is influenced by circulating factors, growth factors, cytokines, immune factors. We should be able to measure these in the blood to avoid the problems of tissue biopsy and directly measure biologic activity to diagnose, to stage, to measure drug response in real time rather than having to wait for clinical changes. Blood biomarkers are the forefront of research in all other major fibrotic diseases, pulmonary fibrosis, scleroderma, liver fibrosis, cardiovascular disease. This is the motivation behind the International Dupuytren Data Bank, or IDDB, to study Dupuytren as a chronic disease and develop quantitative blood biomarker measurements of biologic activity. This is an online, crowdsourced, natural history study using validated self-reported data engaging directly with patients, not dependent on surgeons or locations. Launched in 2015, currently have almost 6,000 Dupuytren and over 700 control enrollees from 61 countries. The long game is to identify blood biomarkers that correlate with Dupuytren disease activity, develop a disease activity profile, identify potential therapeutics, and use the blood panel to manage ongoing medical treatment. Simple idea. The survey uses previously validated self-reported visual metrics for people to report nodules and cords and uses the BSSH visual score of the most contracted finger. Our demographics are similar to other Dupuytren surveys. We expect some self-enrollment bias. Just over half the enrollees are women. Average self-reported duration of disease, a little over eight years. One in five have letter hose. One in five report frozen shoulder women twice as often as men. One in seven have knuckle pads. One in 14 men report a history of Peroni, about what you'd expect in a random sample of 40 to 70 year old white men. Half have a family history of Dupuytren and they're a few years younger on average than those without. The 40% of enrollees who've had prior treatment are a few years older than those without. No surprises there. Here's a surprise. Angular contracture of the most bent finger in those with no prior treatment correlates more strongly with age than with self-reported duration of disease. On the left, using self-reported angle measurements, IDDB data of all untreated patients with or without contracture. On the right, my practice data, untreated patients with contractures measured in the office. Different data collection techniques, same straight line relationship between age and composite angular contracture of the most bent finger. There's no effect of family history, no effect of gender on this relationship in either data set. If we were to extend these lines, we'd hit zero contracture close to age zero, 
Maybe preclinical Dupuytren begins at birth and contracture is just the late tipping point. Let's look at isolated single joint contractures in those with no prior treatment. Two observations. First, if you use self-reported duration of disease, you find a large effect of family history and a lot of data scatter. However, if we calculate rates using patient age, this effect goes away and the error bars narrow dramatically. Second, in patients with no prior treatment, angular contraction progresses more rapidly at the PIP than the MCP joint, supporting the geometric concepts I reviewed earlier. Euclid, the father of geometry, would be proud. 5% of enrollees have had radiotherapy and 6% have had corticosteroid injections. 40% of enrollees have had corrective procedures, open, percutaneous, or enzymatic. It's impressive how many have had multiple procedures. Regardless of technique, of those who've had a procedure, almost half have had two or more, almost a quarter, three or more, one in eight, four or more, and one in 30 have had more than six procedures. One in 36 of those treated have had at least one amputation. We need to develop preventive treatments to reduce the need and the number of corrective procedures. If a disease has many treatments, it means either they all work or none of them work well. In the latter case, people shop for better options. Of the IDDB enrollees who've had any treatment, a third have had more than one type of procedure. One out of 20 have had the trifecta of open and percutaneous and enzymatic treatment, looking for the curative procedure that doesn't yet exist. Half of enrollees report a relative with Dupuytren. A quarter have an affected first degree relative, parent, sibling, or child. 2% or 116 enrollees report Dupuytren in both parents. In addition to natural history, a goal of this study is to recruit people with a high likelihood of having Dupuytren related abnormalities in circulation. It's a catch 22. Our clinical measurements aren't great but they're all we have to go on. So for our pilot study, we're recruiting people with three or more areas of active nodular disease, diagnosis younger than age 50, and at least two close relatives with disease. 4% of enrollees meet all these criteria. For practical reasons, we're starting blood analysis within the continental United States. People meeting all these criteria are scattered, which supports crowdsourced rather than practice-based recruitment. Our goal is to stop Dupuytren disease, not just before it becomes Dupuytren contracture, but before myofibroblasts arrive, before fibrosis begins. Dupuytren is a process, not an event. There's a growing focus in other fibrotic disease research areas on prefibrotic abnormalities in mechanotransduction, in regulation of matrix stiffness, and in persistent epigenetic programming of fibrocyte and fibroblast lineages, these are potential origins of Dupuytren. The IDDB's design is to survey a spectrum of dynamic markers in the blood. We're casting a broad multi-omic net to validate prior work and discover new candidates. In our initial work, whole exome sequencing, DNA, is the least important assay, one, because it's not dynamic, and two, Productive DNA analysis of a common polygenic disease like Dupuytren needs a cohort size of 10 to 20,000 with disease and a comparable number of controls. The IDDB focus is more on dynamic markers in the blood that haven't been investigated. Small RNA, messenger RNA, whole genome bisulfite sequencing of epigenetic changes, and a broad proteomic survey, all collected at the same time to be able to look at dynamic relationships between different categories. We're collecting sequential data and have just begun analysis. This is exploratory. There's no short list of dynamic blood biomarkers that simply need a validating study. The Dupuytren Research Group is an independent nonprofit, and I invite anyone interested in collaborating on this work to contact me for further discussion. Thanks very much. Good luck and stay well.